How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I really glad to have this opportunity to talk with you. Of course, me too. Thank you so much for coming on uh, earlier. It's okay, no problem. How's your life going with this pandemic, COVID nineteen? It's good. I uh, I actually uh, bought a lot of equipment in my mm -hmm. home. Yeah. So uh, I was I I've been able to train a lot. In the beginning, I was doing a lot of body weight exercises, and I got really bored. So I bought equipment. Yeah. And uh, when now I live in Dubai, so now there's no uh, lockdown. You can you can go outside. But oh, before that, there was um, in April we had like a three weeks complete lockdown. You couldn't go out at all. Oh, for how long? It was like three weeks where you literally couldn't move from your house. Oh yeah. Um, it was in uh, April, but yeah. So when when they did that for cardio, I was actually going in the garage because we have like the underground parking of yeah. my building. <laughs> and I was like doing sprints and like running down there. <laughs> so I, it's funny because I think uh, Corona and uh, the virus in general, it, it really helped people get very creative with their workouts. Like exactly. you can see people, people were going like in their balconies, people were working out with their chairs, with their uh, suitcases, yeah. with water bottles. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's uh, it was really good to see. I think people people really like are now more conscious of their health, and uh, they care a lot more about fitness. You know. Yeah, yeah, and make the people very creative. Yes. Yeah, and the other part is good because I think for the long time people do not be with each other. That's so good, right? The family all with with each other. That's good. That's not bad yeah yeah okay perfect can we we all like to know about your squash more uh, could you please introduce yourself about the squash when you start have how long you have been playing a squash of course so my name is kenzie i'm 26 i turned 26 uh in may so this this past may oh, um happy birthday Thank you. I spent it on uh, Zoom with my friends, so it was uh, it was not fun. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe next. Uh, yeah, yeah. So anyway, I uh, I grew up in Egypt and I was born and raised there. I started playing when I was I would say seven, seven years old. Um, and I actually didn't like squash in the beginning. It was it, it was for me like a punishment. I hated it. I thought it was very hard because I couldn't. I couldn't hit the ball on the wall like right away. It took so long for me to be able to do that. So in the beginning, I really, really didn't like the sport. It was more like my parents were, you know, they, they were both squash players and uh, they didn't play professionally or anything, but they were, they both liked the sport. Yeah. So they started, I was playing so many other sports. Like I was playing swimming and gymnastics and horseback riding and volleyball and handball. I was playing so many sports. Running. Running, everything. Um, <laughs> But um, I think squash, so they were, they were more than anything else. Um, what happened is I started training regularly, and I think the, the first turning point in my life was when I was nine. Perfect. Good age. Uh, my, my parents decided I was going to go play the German Junior Open. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I saw, uh, my parents decided I, I needed to you know, go, go play an international tournament. And at that time, I was nine, and uh -huh. they, they used to have uh, under 11 category. I, I don't, it, it doesn't exist right now. Now, the, the, the youngest one is under 13s. Oh, yeah. Uh, but at that time, there was under 11s. So I went to that tournament, and I got second place. And oh, perfect. I think this was the moment when I realized, uh, so I, I remember really well, I got a medal. I didn't get a trophy but I got a medal and I was standing second place and this is the moment when I realized I had such adrenaline going on and the feeling of the rush that I felt of actually winning and of like competing and yeah. of getting number two spot and no I wanted to be number one and I wanted to beat more players and then I realized that I was actually good because I didn't know I didn't realize and yeah. I beat I beat other players and my mom a lot of people were telling her you know this kid is talented 
And I think this is when I started really focusing on squash and I left all the other sports. I was nine and I decided to go full on squash, squash, squash. And I, I really liked it at that point. And I started improving and things like that. I think I was also very lucky because I grew up in um, in Cairo and uh, Heliopolis. I played in Heliopolis Club, which is one of, you know, one of the most successful uh, squash teams in the world, yeah. I would say, even not only in Egypt. Um, so I was always surrounded by really big, successful players and really well-known players. And I think this is why Egypt is so good in squash, because you grow up being surrounded by such successful people. And it, they give you hope and they give you that eager to, to train harder and to, they put such a high standard for the sport that you just grow up wanting to be like them, you know, and you aspire to be like them. So I, was, I was definitely very lucky. And, uh, professionally, Thanks. when I was 13, uh -huh. 13 years old. And uh, same thing. I was just, you know, playing for fun, playing a bunch of tournaments here and there. And uh, I, 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 I really liked the fact that I was the underdog. So it's, it's really nice when you're the young kid who's, you know, ranked 200 or something, and then you're competing with top 100 uh, ranked women in the world, and you go in when yeah. you're just having fun. And I think I, I played really good squash when, whenever I was the underdog. I always think it's much harder for you to play younger younger uh, you know any any younger female players or anyone who's you know supposed to not beat you and then you're going with so much pressure so it's definitely a lot it was a lot easier for me to um, improve my game and gain my confidence at that time because I had nothing to lose and I started yeah. playing really good squash and mm -hmm. I started you know I started going um going up in the rankings and I, I, I um, you know, I started breaking top 100 and then top 90 and then top 80 and things were moving really well. Um, I would say the biggest challenge for me was balancing high school and squash at the same time because I went oh, yeah. to a French, French international um, high school and it was a pretty hard French system. Oh, yeah. So it took me a while to be able to adapt, you know, training with my social life, with my education. Yeah. Um, but again, uh, up till I was 17, things were moving well. I was doing okay in school. I wasn't like, the, the, you know, ex exceeding in my academics or anything, but I was also really focused on squash, playing a lot of yeah. tournaments internationally. Like my parents were super supportive. Everything was going well. And then when I graduated high school, which was in 2000, at the end of 2011, beginning of 2012, mm -hmm. um, I wanted to play full-time squash I didn't want to continue my academics anymore I just wanted to you know uh, be a full-time athlete and uh, not have to worry about awesome. any, any academics but of course my parents said no <laughs> they said I had to continue <laughs> my schooling um I think uh I mean obviously they were they were absolutely right but what what happened then was I was in um I was playing the world juniors in uh, Boston so Boston University in Harvard, um, sorry, in Boston uh, at Harvard University, we were playing the World Junior Championships. And at that time, they were, they were like, you know, scouts, uh, recruiters from colleges who, who were going to these World Junior Tournaments to, to seek players to go study in America and get, go on a, either a really high financial aid or on a full scholarship. And oh, at that time, Sorry? I said, oh, perfect. Yeah. So at that time, it was very, uh, you know, this, you, have to, you have to understand that this was like 2011, right? Like people in Egypt specifically going to America to study was such a foreign, foreign concept. It's not like now. I feel like now it's so popular. Everyone is going to like either London, either like the UK or the US or like whatever. They, they just travel to study. I think it's even now a lot of Egyptians are going for high school, even not even college. So like boarding school. So I think now that the, obviously the concept of going abroad is a lot more popular, but at that time it wasn't that popular. So for me, I was a bit worried and a bit confused and I didn't want to leave Egypt. And, you know, I was only 17, but I got a really good opportunity to go abroad and that's when I, I understood that uh, you know this this might actually be a really good opportunity for me to go study in a really good university in America and at the same time play squash for the team and my college oh, yeah. and also play professionally 
So it was a good, okay. it was kind of a good balance of academics and squash. Um, so I, I ended up traveling in 2012, yeah, 2012, I went to America, I went to Trinity College. It's one of the best squash uh, colleges in, the, in America. I played number one there for four years and uh, I double majored in international studies and French and I minored in urban studies. And uh, I was also playing professionally at the same time. So it was, a, you know, it was honestly like fast forward, like the best four years of my life. I had a blast. It was so nice going from playing, you know, as an individual in Egypt to going to this college and squash becoming such a team sport because for me it was always an individual sport. But when I went to school, it was like I'm playing a match, but if I win, my whole team will win. If I lose, my whole team will lose. So it, it really gave me that sense of responsibility, not just of my result, but of the whole team. And I think that was the best part of it. That you know, it turned into it turned into being such a great experience with my team, and it just it just was a really good experience. So I graduated in 2016. Um, uh, when I graduated, I won right before I graduated. I won the individuals uh, CSA national championship. So I was number one college player in America for my senior year, and uh, I was also ranked ranked number 30th and the PSP award ranking. Um, so that was in 2016 when I, you know, when I graduated. Um, yeah, uh, after that, I, I stayed in America for two more years from 2016 to 2018. I was still playing full-time professionally. Uh, but I think what went wrong is that I, it started becoming uh, a very, uh, like you know how I was telling you before I was playing for fun I was the underdog there was no pressure I had no expectations but when I graduated I said to myself you know what now is your time to play full-time squash yeah and uh, you need to, you need to be top 10 you need to be number one in the world you need to beat all these players you have no excuse you have to put all these expectations you know this is now the way you make money you have to be financially independent and I had just like all these expectations of myself and I, it wasn't fun anymore it was me like I was like if I win I have to win I have to win I have to win it wasn't like it wasn't fun anymore you know um, yeah, of course I think and I wasn't doing as well as I wanted to in the rankings so I was moving maybe like two or three spots every now and then I wasn't you know doing the greatest moves um, in the ranking and the ladder so I think I got a lot, you know, I got disappointed in myself too fast. I had, I didn't really have that patience of like, it's a process. It's going to take you, you know, a year or two or even three or five to get to the top 10. It, it's not like a button. You're not going to press a button and be top 10. So <laughs> yeah. I think I was, uh, I put so much pressure on myself that when I was playing, it was very stressful and I couldn't really focus on my game because all I could think of was like winning, winning, winning. It wasn't. Uh, you know, enjoy what you're doing or like focus on the ball or things like that. Um, yeah. I decided to move back to Egypt in, at the end of 2018 uh, to see if maybe like moving and uh, going back home and playing squash in Egypt would be the right move. Maybe, uh, you know, the U.S. wasn't uh, the perfect environment for me or maybe I just needed a change or maybe I just needed to be, you know, near my family or I needed to go back to Heliopolis Club. I, I was a bit confused. Um, and I started playing again, you know, I started uh, training and uh, I, I went to, you know, the US Open and I went to a couple of tournaments and I got really, really, really badly injured on my back. Um, and I couldn't play for like at least five months. Oh so it was the combination of like not being able to play and at the same time being so uh, like feeling down about the sport, like not feeling like I'm doing as well as I wanted to. Um, so I, I decided, think. you know, you know what, if, if I'm not enjoying it and if I'm not, uh, if it's not fun anymore, then what's the point? And I can't even, you know, my back, I had, I've been having back issues for the last like seven or eight years. It's been an ongoing problem. So it, it you know, it, it was my, my body was physically hurting. And at the same time, mentally, I wasn't in, the, the, the right mind mindset to you know to play professionally because it's really it's really tough and I really I really admire you know every single woman or even male player out there who, who have managed to even get through 
all the nerves of squash and even go through, you know, Corona and everything that's going on right now, it's not mm-hmm. easy. Um, yeah, but this was, this was just my path. And of course I still play right now. I play all the time in Dubai. I coach and, uh, I play, I literally have squash courts in my building here. So I play, you know, I oh, play every day. I compete, I compete uh, locally and, uh, I, you know, I compete, uh, on like a friendly basis and I compete in small tournaments, but professional wise, I don't do that anymore. Um, but I decided to take a more of a professional career. So I work in, uh, I work in events here in Dubai and, uh, I do a lot of things in Dubai, but at the end, my, at the end of the day, squash will always be a part of me. It's, it's always going to be, you know, a, a part of my identity. I would have not been here without squash. It's like completely shaped who I am, my personality, my and everything everything taught me and yeah i mean that's that's basically it i see and uh, do you have any league tournament in dubai oh can they can you hear me they're mainly yeah yeah, yeah i can hear you yeah. we have perfect we, there are tournaments here but they're more like um like mixed tournaments so you don't only play with females you play against males and females as well and uh they, yeah th- there's a bunch of them i mean obviously they're not if you compare them to the professional level it's not uh, it wouldn't it wouldn't even compare um it's a much lower level but because people here like you don't have professionals competing in it um, yeah. but it's still it keeps things fun it's still uh, you know it's still fun to, to be competing anyway even if it's not on a professional level it's still it's yeah. still uh, nice is it going to be popular in dubai right now it's not uh, it's not that popular um even though you have all the resources here in dubai like you have over a thousand five hundred squash courts and you know you have a lot of interest because you have uh, so many expats here dubai has over 200 nationalities so i think the interest is definitely there you have a lot of people from the uk who love squash from pakistan from india you have a lot of people who like squash but there's no awareness for it or there's no enough there's not enough awareness about it so oh, yes. i think it could be popular down the line but it definitely needs a lot of uh, like really big you know marketing campaigns and big initiatives and and a lot more awareness for people to understand um that you know you can play squash here but in terms of like academies like there's not there, i think there's only one academy here so there's also not enough squash communities in the uae for it to be a super popular sport but obviously everyone is you know hoping for the best oh uh, i see um as a lot of squash player uh, gonna see our record i want to ask you a question can you imagine you are in the middle of the match and suddenly you lost your concentration, right? What do you do? So you can do a bunch of things. What I used to do though, is I used mm-hmm. to think about one thing. So let's say I lost my concentration because you know I'm focused on the people outside or I'm focused on winning or losing or things like that. What my strategy to do that was basically to think about one thing because if you tell yourself concentrate 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 you know you're not going to concentrate yeah it i agree it doesn't work like that you can't it's, you can't just like this this is just me like if i can't concentrate and i just keep telling myself concentrate concentrate it's not going to work so for me i used to think about one specific thing and just do that so like for example i would tell myself Hit the ball, hit, hit the ball like hard and low. That's it. That, or like uh, to the back. Hit the ball to the back. And because my mind would be so uh, focused on hitting the ball to the back, my mind would only think about that in that moment, and that would eventually help me to get back to my game and help me get back to my strategy of the game. So my advice would be to think about one thing that you wanna do in that match, whether it's mm-hmm. like you know uh, getting the ball to the back or like volleying more, whatever it is, but just make sure you get your focus back to the game. Or it could be as simple, by the way, it doesn't even need to be you telling yourself something. It can be like, you know, sometimes people have, uh, this is obviously very personal, each, each player is different, but you could do, before you serve, for example, 
you're going to, you know, bounce the ball five times. Take your time, one, two, three, four, five, because that kind of reboots and resets your mind, and then you can start serving. Or you could, like, tie your shoelace, you know, for, for two seconds. Not every point, obviously, but just to reset your, your, your mind and how you're thinking. Or just take a really quick walk to the front of the court. Like, just do something that will reset your mind and your body to start a new, a new point. Yeah, I see. Thank you so much. And I have another question. What kind of information do you like to give from your coach in the in your interval time between the game? As a coach or as a player? As a player. As a player, I would always, you know, when I when I when I I didn't always do that, but this would be my advice is to uh, you know, when you when you get out, you need to be completely uh, calm. And not think about the mistake. Yeah, not not with the mistakes, but stop thinking about. Stop blaming yourself because I used to do that sometimes. Like I would go out and be like, "Oh, I should have done this." It's it's still the match is not over. So instead of yeah. regretting, you know, because I was like, "Oh, I should have done this this point. Why didn't I do this? Why didn't I do this?" Instead of just regretting everything you've done wrong, maybe like take a minute to think about it and see how you can make it better. And that comes from the coach because instead of saying. Uh, you know, because you're thinking about all these negative things. Instead of that, just like stop, yeah. take a moment, listen to your coach and maybe ask him questions. Be like, what do I do here, for example? And then he's going to give you solutions. So instead of thinking about the problems and really beating yourself up, maybe just calm down, listen to your coach and really take that time to breathe because, you know, squash is super intense. And if you don't, if you don't take your proper rest, you're really going to break down. So, yeah, I, 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 that would be my advice. Just really, really take it in. Listen to your coach. Don't get upset. Don't get angry. I, I, I'm not saying I used to do this all the time. I used to, like, a lot of the times, I used to come up between, between games and be so upset about, you know, losing 14-12. Uh, or, like, I should have won that game. I should have won that game. But, again, thinking about the past is not going to change anything. So, the best strategy would be to just think about how you can win the rest of the match because it's still not over. Oh yeah, correct. It's happened for me before. Uh, I remember <laughs> I had a match. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, two uh, zero, two love, and then the last uh, the last game I was ten and my opponent was three. I lost my concentration, and I just say blame myself, and I lost the match. Exactly. exactly. Three two. Yeah, because you get in your head. I mean, squash is so such a mental game. You have to be so mentally strong, and that's how you lose your focus, and that's how you lose your mental strength, and that's how you start thinking about other things. You you think about all these negative things, and you forget what your strategy yeah. actually is and what your game plan is. Yeah, and, and sometimes I th we think it's over. Yeah. Yeah. And then Before you it. you're going to do exactly. Or you say, or you say, oh, I've won, you know, like, or you think you've won too fast and then all of a sudden you lost the match because you just thought about exactly. winning too fast. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, one more question. Uh, imagine you have a tough match tomorrow evening. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do from today until your match? So usually the day before I go, so uh, I, I train, but very lightly on the court that, I'm, that I have the match on. So um, because, you know, every court uh, is a bit different. Sometimes the wall, it, it hits the ball differently or uh, the floor is a bit slippery or, you know, the, whatever it is, the, 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 the court is cold or is a bit, it's a bit hot. There's always something a tiny bit different in each squash court. So I would love to, you know, this is always my priority is to go the day before and try out the court and kind of, feel things out and see if there's anything I specifically need to do. Sometimes, you know, there's a, the backhand front corner, the ball dies more than usual. So I'm going to try to focus on that more. Um, mm -hmm. So I would do that. And then I'm the type of person that I don't like to change my routine right before a match. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, if I'm in training, I'm used to like waking up, uh, you know, g going to the mall and then, uh, you know, eating lunch at home and then going to practice. I'll do, I'll do my normal routine during, during, uh, you know, during uh, any day, because if I change my routine the day before the match and I'm like, I'm not going to leave the room, the hotel room, I'm just going to stay focused and, you know, in the hotel, 
that doesn't mm -hmm. really work for me. And this is just me personally. A lot of players like to zone in, you know, they don't like to leave the hotel or like they really like to stay in the zone and not really uh, mingle and social socialize with people. But for me, doing that was kind of breaking my usual routine and it kind of messes, mm -hmm. you know, it messes up with my system. So I like to do things as usual and I don't change my food right before a match. I, I like to eat whatever my body is used to. Obviously, there are things like I'm going to avoid, like I'm, I'm going to eat whatever is best for energy and things like that. But I don't do any drastic changes before my matches. Mm -hmm. But on the day of the match or the day before, actually what I do is I meditate. So I put like really good meditation music in my, you know, in my earphones. And I really like to imagine what that match would look like. Imagine me, you know, uh, lunging, swinging, playing a rally in a certain way. Um, and that kind of that visualization really helps me um, prepare mentally for the game and really helps me set my mind right to the game. Uh, on the day of the match itself, if my match is in the evening, then I'd like to also go in the morning hit for literally 20 minutes, something really, really, really short, just to get the blood flowing. Mm -hmm. um, and then I usually nap. Uh, I usually have lunch first and then a nap a bit and then I'll go. Um, I like to go to my matches really early, so maybe an hour and a half before my match to, you know, get used to the environment and kind of loosen up and have my time to warm up, have my time to meditate again before my match. So, uh, so yeah, I, I like to uh, go early. And, uh, of course, after the match, you have to stretch, you have to hydrate, you have to eat, you have to sleep yeah. again. So... I'm not very strict with my routine, but I'm not very lenient either. I think I'm, I, I was usually like very balanced in the way of like resting and also, you know, following my regular routine without being an extremist in, in either way. Oh, I see. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Kenzie, have you ever upset with your referee? Oh yeah, so many, so many times. <laughs> So many times yeah yeah it's uh i think when i was younger it was worse because uh in junior tournaments uh, especially you know in egypt we when this was earlier on i think now things have changed and things have been a lot more strict but when i was younger when i you know i used to you know we, we used to all of us <laughs> we used to yell at referees and like get upset and the coaches would yell and the parents would yell and i think uh, the, the culture has been changing it's been improving um but as i grew up i i i've learned to control my feelings a bit more and be be more uh you know patient and not like not let any uh, judge judges this like uh, referees decision get to me because that's exactly what we were talking about earlier it really messes up with your concentration and it gets you out of the mood um and it, it can really affect you mentally so i've tried to be better throughout the years and i think i did i, I was able to get better but it's still of course i'm not gonna say i wasn't getting mad at referees of course it happened um the good thing though is that you know uh, either juniors or PSA or Egypt or any country, I think the rules have been a lot more strict now. Like if you throw your glasses yeah. on the floor, if you throw your racket, if you yell, whatever it is, you take a warning, another warning, and then the, the game is over and then the match is over. So I think these rules are, are really good to keep people, you know, to keep people intact and to keep them in control, more in control of their emotions and to be becoming more patient. Um, yeah. But some sometimes it's just sometimes it's just inevitable. Like sometimes you just yeah you 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 can't control it. So yeah. yeah yeah I really I really like this rule because I'm a referee. I'm a national referee in Iran and in Canada. So I really like this uh, rule because actually some countries player they discuss discussion a lot and they threw their locket, racket and blah blah and so you. We can use easily our conduct, and then we can manage the match. So I really like this rule. Yeah, yeah, me too. It's good. <laughs> it's good. Yeah, it's good. You have to think twice. Like before you throw your racket, you're like, oh, not doing uh, it. Like, yeah. It really, yeah. it really makes you think twice before you get angry. Exactly. And one more thing, the the player couldn't open the door easily right now. That's what so do good. You mean? In during. 
during the PSA rule, if the player without uh, asking the referee open the uh, door, oh, yeah, they can yeah. give conduct a stroke directly. Yeah, yeah, you, it's not as lenient anymore. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I think it's good. Yeah, yeah, me too, and, me too. Yeah. Hindi, as I know, uh, you are working as a manager for events, right? Yes, I'm an events manager. Have you ever think about uh, make a camping for a squash with another country? For example, you invite Iran or Iran invites your team yeah. and make an event. Have you ever thought about? Yeah, yeah. I definitely have been thinking about that for a long time. The, the, only, the, only, the, the only thing with that is that there's so much more technicalities and so much like a lot of logistics and a lot of things that comes with that you don't just it's not as easy as inviting a country here you know it's you need to have a legal entity here you need to have courts you need to have coaches you need to have all the rules and regulations done uh, you need to have a contract there's so much admin work and there's so many you know legalities around it it's definitely doable um but it just requires a lot of time and energy that i just haven't been able to you know put, put all my focus on it it's definitely something I would love to do long term. Uh, I think there, there are great opportunities here, especially for camps and things like that for kids. It, it would be great. Um, but I just, uh, I definitely thought about it, but I still haven't uh, acted upon it yet. Perfect. I wish one day you can do it. Thank I you. Wish. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> okay. Are you ready? I want to ask you some, uh, not a question, I just say one word. I wanna you to tell me your feeling. Okay. Okay. The first one, the Nash Cup. Nash Cup. Nash Cup was like my first PSA title ever. So in my final, this is funny uh -huh. you said that, but you said one word, right? Not like uh, No, no, no. For okay. me it's one word. You can ah, okay. it. Um it's funny because in my, uh, you know, it was my first, I'm trying to remember, like, so basically it took me at least, at least, I'm, I'm not joking, it took me at least four to five months to get my, my Canadian visa, so to go to Canada to play that tournament. And up till the last second, I was in college at that time, and I didn't think I was going to get my visa. And mm -hmm. luckily, one of my friends, her dad works as uh, in, in one of the, in one of the embassies in, in New York, and they were able to speed up the process and get me my passport with the with the visa. And I and I flew like last minute, and I end up missing my first flight and flying the next day. And it was my first ever title. So in my final, I remember this so well. In the final, uh, I wasn't worried about winning because the, uh, you know the opponent I was playing, I I've beaten her ten times, like so many times before, and she's never beaten me. But it's funny how that first final and that first uh, first time for me to reach like a, like you know a PSA final and I was so so scared in the in the final that's not usually how I am but I remember <laughs> that I was I was so nervous I was so nervous even I was two love up and I was mm -hmm. like seven two up or something and I was still like shaking and in my head I'm like stop you're 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 like four points away from winning the tournament um it was definitely a really nice a really a really nice feeling and it really helped me get over that fear and anxiety that i used to have in uh in big finals but it was it was a great feeling it was a great great experience well and the other one jp morgan jp morgan my favorite tournament ever uh i was very fortunate in jp morgan because I've always had really good experiences there. I actually took the wild card uh, at the TOC twice. And that, of course, helped me so much because, you know, you didn't have to go through the qualifications and you can di directly play um, in the main draw. But my first ever TOC experience, I was 17. And mm -hmm. I, played, I played Rachel uh, Grenham on the glass. And I remember I was so overwhelmed by New York I, I it was my first time to actually see the TOC inside the Grand Central Station and I was so mesmerized by it I thought it was the, the, the craziest like 
the coolest thing in the world. And I was two love up against Rachel and I lost three two. So I remember I was crying and things like that. But what happened that day was really funny because I ended up diving. Uh, you know, when I was 17, I dove a bunch of times and a bunch of like news articles wrote about it. And then, so 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. So now four or five <laughs> years later, um, when I played Camille on the, on, in the TOC, I ended up, you know, the four diving videos, that was something uh, that, that was, you know, that was, uh, it was different. But uh, that year when I played Camille, the, what I'm most proud of, wasn't Camille's match. It was me get, getting through qualifications and then playing Camille with that level because I, I, like, by far, that year, 2015, in the TOC, that was the hardest qualification draw I've ever played. Like, I remember so well. I, I beat um, uh, um, Nicolette, which was, like, a top 20 player at that time. And then I beat um, Heba. And then I beat, uh, who else did I beat? <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> uh, sorry, I don't remember. But I beat someone else. Oh, I beat Donna. Yeah, so I beat uh -huh. Donna first, and then Nicolette, and then Hiva. So it was three really, really intense matches in a row. And yeah. each one of them was just a hell of a match. Like, I remember I used to get out, like, so, so tired, so beat. And... The fact that I was able to play Camille right the next day, so I didn't even rest. I didn't even have a day rest after my qualifications. So the fact that I was able to go in and play against Camille with that specific level after I had played all these qualifications matches was, uh, this is what I was most proud of. Yeah. Awesome. And it's squash on fire. Squash on fire, of course. The first thing that comes <laughs> to my head is Amirogi, obviously. Uh, you know, the king of squash. Um, definitely, you know, I, I love Squash on Fire. I played there a couple of times. Uh, mm -hmm. But if anything that comes to my head is just Amir Wagi, nothing else, literally. Like, this is just his baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the next person is Ali Ismail. Ali Ismail. Oh, nice. Yeah, Ali was my uh, fitness coach for uh, for a long time. Uh, not a long time. He was my fitness coach for, uh, I would say, three to four months. Uh, Ali actually went to the same high school as me, so uh, fun fact. Oh. Um, but yeah, I, I totally respect that guy. He came from nothing, you know. He started this completely self-made. He started from training two people to having his own gyms in Egypt. So um, great guy, great coach, uh, very, very advanced fitness levels. So he, he helped me a lot in my game. Awesome. Noor Al Tayyip. Noor, like I grew up with Noor. I've known Noor for for now ever since I was seven, literally. Uh, she was she was always some someone I looked I looked up to and someone I highly respect. And her game was always, you know, uh, more advanced than mine. And I would I might have been you know physically stronger, but her mind was always ahead. So she she has the perfect ability to really like kill my body just by using your brain so <laughs> i was always the dumb one who's like running around her and she's just like so freaking focused and so smart in the court and she reads you very well like she's before i hit the court she, the, the the ball she's already there um i think mm -hmm. Nora and i like we always grew up being you know close um squash players we were always training together and i remember at some point we were training together so much that we just knew each other's games by heart like literally like we would be there before the other person hits the ball um i've had such great experiences with noor and i have great great memories with her ever since ever since we were young um so yeah and i i wish her all the best i know now she's like you know uh not yet number one but i i really believe she she could make it there soon and stay there for a long time awesome the last one but the most important one Nevin Albaz. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Nevin Albaz comes with Ahmed Dafrawi, like my dad. They both come together, and I think they both were, you know, the biggest reason of my success. Uh, always so supportive, especially my dad, who's like, you know, he he made me 
he was uh, he was giving me so many opportunities to fly everywhere I wanted to play tournaments. No matter no matter what the result was, it was either losing or winning. He was always so motivating. He really believed in me. Really believed in my capabilities. They were both really involved in you know coming to my practices, speaking to my coaches, making sure I'm happy, making sure I'm getting the right you know uh, training sessions. So supportive and. I, I I definitely owe it all to them. Like uh, you know, especially my thought. Like I I would have been nowhere uh, nowhere near where I am today without them. So definitely, biggest credit. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, are you ready to play a game? Sure. Sure. Okay. I ask a question. You just can answer by yes or no. Okay. Okay. Have you ever had cheating on your score during the match? Have I ever had what? Sorry? Cheated on your score. No, not on my score, but on other things. Jealous <laughs> <laughs> person? Sorry? Are you a jealous person? Jealous? Yeah. It depends on the situation. I don't I generally know, but it, it but, depends but on you the situation. But you have to say by yes or no. Okay, yes. <laughs> Thank you for being honest. Have you ever <laughs> told lie to your coach for not to go to for training? A hundred percent, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Can you keep 100% of secret, people's secret? Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, Kenzie. My question is done, but I want to know, do you want anything else to tell us and add to our conversation? Um... No, not really. I think I think we uh, I think we talked a lot. I, I I'm honestly so happy that we were able to do this, and it was really nice to to see that you know squash in Iran is growing and it's actually doing something and it's connecting. Like I saw in your you know the, the, there's really a lot of effort with you guys in creating content. I saw you were interviewing you know Camille and Miguel and so so many players, and I think it's yeah. it's so great what you guys are doing, and coming from you know Iran. Um, it's it's great because the squash scene there is not was even non-existent a couple of years ago, but it's really starting to grow, and I really see a bunch of females even you know starting to like the sport and being more passionate about it. And I think what you guys are yeah. doing is great because you're getting all this content and you're offering it to either Iran or whoever you know any young generations watching it, and it will yeah. really give people more encouragement and more you know you know more. Uh, more reasons to, to, to stick to the sport. And I think now is the perfect time to do it because we're in Corona or, you know, everyone is quarantined yeah. or staying home. So creating this type of content right now is, is really important and it's crucial. And I think you guys are like really kudos to you guys for doing this now. And all the, I, I wish you guys all the best. And if you ever need anything from my side, I'd, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to help you guys. Oh, thank you so much. You are so nice. And I'm really, really happy because I have opportunity to talk with you and I'm really enjoy it. Perfect. I think I'm going to watch this video more than 10 times. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's so nice. Thank you so much. Of course, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank for you. Me. Have a good night. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.